first uh, for the first inputs to you in a second. Um, and uh, for my role in this, um, um, some may, of you may know already, uh, I'm serving in the Inquiry Committee on Animal Transport in the European Parliament, uh, which we finally have reached with uh, more than 600 votes in the Parliament. So I'm working a lot. Uh, very intensively, much more intensive than before on animal transports. It's a topic uh, I work on a lot already since many years, but uh, increasingly in the last months. And I will come back to that later. So with these circumstances and with this uh, starting uh, um, introduction words, I hand over directly uh, to Julia Hafenstein. Welcome to this parallel session and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you and, and the Greens for giving us the possibility to talk about animal transport today. And well, I've been I've been doing missions uh, on animal transport for nearly twenty years now, and I'd say there is still a lot to do. Even so, animal transport might be the most visible farm animal welfare problem. There's so much that goes wrong there. This is because transporters do not comply with the animal welfare rules. The authorities are not able to enforce them properly. And the legislation itself does not protect the animals properly. So, therefore, what action is necessary? What has to be done? We believe that, first of all, the revision of Council Regulation 1-2005 is urgently necessary. The current legal framework to protect the animals during transport does not sufficiently protect them because, because it's vague, it's complex, it offers a lot of room for interpretation it is not consistent with other EU legislation. It does not offer any journey time limit. It is not so, it is not consistent with international standards. Spaces are insufficient to maintain welfare and safety of the animals. And it is not updated with scientific evidence. And as I said before, it's not properly enforced because partly it's not enforceable at all. for the revision of Well, first of all, the drastic journey time limit for all commercial transports of live animals. This would reduce the animal welfare problems significantly. significantly. As according to scientific experts, after four hours of transport and at least after eight hours of transport, the animals suffer and it would also reduce the risk of disease spread and of course contracting diseases during transport because the animals during transport get more susceptible to infections. According to the Federation the, vet, the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, animal transport should be subject to the 3R principle. It should be refined, reduced and replaced wherever possible. And animals should be reared as close as possible to the premises on which they are born. And they should be slaughtered as close as possible to the point of production. Furthermore, by not stipulating a Journey time limit, the regulation is not in line with the standards of the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, as the OIE requires the amount of time the animals spend on a journey should be kept to the minimum. Finally, whereas 5 to the regulation already demands the reduction of long journeys, but instead during the years they increased, therefore finally a legal restriction is necessary. Well, I would like to show you a short video. No, I, no, I, 
I'm sorry, the video is here. I would like to video illustrating the problems that we see today on animal track. All the images you will see in 2000. Just to tell you that maybe the sound is a bit loud, then you Julia, uh, your your internet connection is quite bad, so your what you're speaking is oh. interrupted constantly. Maybe it's better without your video. Okay, without the yes. camera. So we can hear you well. Well, I think the, the pictures on the video, they, they speak for themselves. And yes, these are not, unfortunately, these are not exceptional cases, but these are cases that we see again and again on our investigations in, within Europe. And well, at, at the first, at the last part of the video, you you saw a heifer lying down during transport. She was just exhaust, exhausted, and this was under under okay transport conditions. So all the legal requirements were complied with, but still, this animal was just totally exhausted after many hours and yeah days of transport in this case. But which is another key point for the revision, um, it's the space that the animals have on the trucks. It is not sufficient for, for the animals. As practice has shown that with the current space allowances, the animals cannot lie down and rest during transport without being trampled by other animals. They cannot stand up again once they lie down. They cannot move adequately. They don't have access to the watering devices when the trucks are too full. And they cannot, they are not able to regulate their body temperature, which is especially a big problem in pig transports. And they cannot be inspected and cared for. In the next slide, I will show you a picture that I took in September in Bulgaria. And in this transport of cattle, the space allowances were consistent with the indications of the regulation. But I think you see clearly that the space is just not sufficient for the animals. There's one animal lying down. It's, it will be impossible for him to get up again, you only see his leg in the, on the left hand. And of course, there's not space enough that all of them can lie down and rest. <clears throat> A further key point for the revision of the regulation, in our opinion, is 
the stop of live export to non-EU countries and especially to high-risk countries. Because, because it's impossible to comply with the rules on the protection of animals during transport in exporting in export transports. Because in most of the countries there are no animal welfare guarantees at all. In most of the importing countries where e standards are not complied with. In many of the importing countries, handling and slaughter methods would be considered crimin criminal acts in the EU. And finally, the export to countries which does not offer any animal welfare guarantees is not consistent with EU primary law. On this slide you see the cow Erika. Erika was exported from Germany to Morocco for milk production, but she ended up in a rural slaughterhouse in Morocco. My Moroccan colleagues accompanied her on her last way and documented her cruel death. Also here, I think the pictures speak for themselves. And well, the pictures were taken in October 2020 so this is what happened. Hap what is happening today when animals are exported to Morocco? In general, the number of animal transports must be reduced. Live animal transports must be replaced by transport of meat, semen, and embryos. So the risk of animal welfare problems will be reduced, of course. Transporting meat instead of live animals will be more sustainable as CO2 emissions and transport costs were lowered. There will be shifts to re regional production and more slaughtering and employment within the EU. Another big concern that we have is the lack of training. There's an urgent need for better training that goes from drivers over police office, police forces to the, to the official veterinarians that often are not properly trained when it comes to animal transport and especially not when it comes to international transports. Then, unfortunately, also better monitoring is absolutely necessary. We ask for the mandatory presence of official veterinarians at the time of loading of every long distance transport. We urge for the creation of task forces. Vets and police specialized in animal transport should work together and form special teams to check on these transports. We absolutely need more emergency unloading facilities because what happens when the police checks a truck with animals on board? If they take the decision that the animals should be unloaded, often they don't find any facilities where to unload them. And so they often decide better not to look inside these animal trucks because then they don't know what to do. We ask for video surveillance at slaughterhouses and at markets. We ask for the rotation of official vets on the one hand to avoid that strict veterinary services are avoided by the stakeholders and on the other hand that there is no kind of back scratching happening at slaughterhouses also at vet services at the time of dispatching animal trucks. We think that more staff dedicated to animal welfare on local, regional and national level is urgently necessary in all member states. And of course, we recommend the better and more collaboration with NGOs. <clears throat> we 
We also ask for more transparency. We think that vets urgently, urgently need to have live access to GPS data of the tracks. And of course, there must be also enough staff at the veterinary services to follow up on this data. Then Italy and the Netherlands, for example, offer public databases for the tracking of animals, at least for cattle. This same system should be available in all Europe and whenever animals are exported to third countries. Furthermore, we think that stricter prosecution and sanctioning of the infringements are, is urgently necessary. Infringements of animal transport rules are all, all too often handled as a bagatelle and warnings after warnings are issued and nothing changes. In our opinion, sanctions must be more dissuasive and more clearly defined. Sanctions must be issued on the spot. In many countries, the sanctioning procedure, procedures take long, maybe months, and in some cases, even years. So the transporters have already forgotten what, what they did wrong. We think that a harmonized sanctioning system within the EU would help a lot. And finally, we think that also official veterinarians should be held accountable. Finally, we think that as long as animals are exported to non-EU countries, the bilateral agreements may not only look at the economic profit in the non-EU in the non -EU countries, which might be a bit better, but animal welfare must be given priority. Well, you see, there's a lot to do. Thank you for standing up for the animals on the transports. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Julia, for your first uh, intervention. Uh, and just for all of you, uh, we're recording this session, first of all, so you will be able to relook it if you want to. Uh, and after my intervention, we will uh, uh, allow you and ask you to step into the discussion and uh, send us your questions uh, while uh, you raise your hand. There's a raise hand function you can use. Uh, and then Theo, who is in the background uh, running the technical support, uh, will uh, give you the floor. I will give you the floor and he will mute you uh, and give you the broadcasting rights. So thank you again for your input. And I will refer to some of the points um, uh, that uh, uh, Julia has already touched. But first of all, I mean, why do we have so many live animal transports on Europe's roads? And it's very much linked to the also agricultural policy of the European Union that favors big entities, big breeders very much. And it's also due to the policy of the European Union in the last, I would say, two centuries that was driving the um, uh, intensification, not only of agriculture, but also of slaughterhouses very much. So a lot of regional slaughterhouses have closed their doors and uh, every year fewer and fewer and bigger and bigger slaughterhouses open their doors with slaughtering capacities, which are far over what a region can actually sustain. So through actually uh, supporting these constructions of big slaughterhouses, much too big for a region with EU fundings, we have created a constant demand of uh, live animal transports. Uh, second of all, I mean, it's uh, also the industrialization of the breeding business that uh, the breeding more and more companies, less and less farmers uh, are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, now we already see uh, stalls uh, for, let's say, cows, diary stalls, up to 20,000 cows built uh, um, in the pork breeding sector, even up to 200,000 pork in one stable at the very same time. So imagine these amounts of animals. And for this, uh, this causes a lot of uh, live animal transports, which in very many cases and very often cause direct suffering for the animals, especially long-term transports. So 
the problems within uh, the European Union, I want to share some of my experiences here uh, with you. Um, there, there's, there are different measurements and different limits to the transportation of different animal uh, kinds, like uh, a chicken or pork or, or, or uh, cows have different transportation limits. Uh, but overall, um, I would say the, the, the cruelty of the whole agricultural system uh, becomes visible in the moment the animals are transported on a public motorway or on a public street. There, it becomes obvious and you, we as citizens can actually have a look what is going on there. So I encourage you, if you see animal transport trucks uh, on parking lots, parking beside the road, take two or three minutes, stop by, have a look, uh, and if you see obvious, uh, uh, let's say, harmed animals, animals bleeding, if you see, uh, if it looks obvious uh, that there's something going wrong here, you can call the police, and the police has to come. And especially if they are called on a, on a, on a case, they cannot avoid of looking into the truck and doing something. And in fact, what is right, and Julia pointed out that um, uh, also police and veterinarians are um, not educated in the same intens intensity across the European Union. Uh, also, uh, giving fines is not as usual everywhere. I know countries where there are practically no fines given. Um, even uh, the, the knowledge what to look at and what to report on and how to deal with the situation uh, we are lacking uh, in some countries or sometimes it's a question what kind of police officer you actually get. Then many of these trucks are actually stopping on the way um, before entering the slaughterhouses. So very often we find trucks um, at all times of the year waiting nearby the slaughterhouses, sometimes for several hours, uh, expanding their transportation time through that in an illegal way. Um, and it's also about the temperature. Uh, there's one thing you can, you can actually very easily check, that is the outside temperature. So animals may not be transported with temperatures below minus five degrees and may not be transported with temperatures over 30 degrees. So if you're on the way in the summer and if you already see that there's more of 30 degrees on your thermometer and you see animal transports, go and check, especially if the animals are parked somewhere because usually as long as the truck moves, the temperatures are not, not that extreme in the truck. But in the moment it stops, most of the times the drivers also stop the, well, they don't have air condition, but just ventilation, but they also stop the ventilation sometimes. But even if they don't stop the ventilation, you can have, if you have outside uh, uh, the, 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 the temperature of uh, 32, 33 degrees, you can have up to 50 degrees in the trucks. And just to remind you, uh, for a cow, the heat stress begins with more than 25 degrees. So have a look and see what happens in there. See if animals are still standing. See if they are tongue rolling. Uh, we haven't seen a picture of that uh, with Julia, but like if they start to roll their tongue like, tongue like that, that's a clear sign of heat stress and it's a clear sign, sign of thirst. Um, so very much uh, we're looking on the transport also outside of the Union. Julia has touched upon that already. And there are, I would say, two kinds of transportations. One is the so-called breeding animals, which are most of the time, in terms of uh, um, uh, cows, it's most of the time female cows, which are early pregnant, which are exported, especially through Russia, towards Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and so on. Uh, and these breeding animals uh, are most of the times treated in a better way than the slaughter animals. But still, there is no guarantees that animal welfare standards and transportation standards are actually uh, um, um, kept through all the journey. Uh, actually, in Russia, there is no proof that there is deloading stations where the animals can rest and they have to be able to rest after a certain transportation time. Uh, so there's a, a real lack of regulation. The European Court of Auditors has clearly ruled that uh, EU um, animal protection standards are eligible until the point of destination. So that means until the animals reach Uzbekistan. But there's no checks and no controls from the side of the European Union. So if you know that animals are exported, you can ask the veterinarians how they are legitimizing that. 
uh, how they can actually sign the papers without knowing for sure that uh, European welfare standards can be applied until the point of destination. And also a very cruel part of animal transportation within Europe is the transportation of calves, which leads me then to the ships. What happens is that due to intensive milk production in a lot of regions of Europe, uh, the calves are kind of the waste of the production. So the calves are sold with a minimum of 10 days. Imagine 10 days old calves. It's practically animal babies. And uh, they they have they have not uh, been uh, they have not been uh, used to normal food. They have not been used to normal water. Uh, they are still drinking milk or milk exchanger. And these calves are then put on trucks. One truck can carry more than 200 calves. So imagine how dense they are. And these calves are then transported towards Croatia, mainly Italy or Spain, to be fattened there and then either go on the European market, which would be the more lucky track, or they are exported by a shipping to the Middle East. And this is countries from Morocco, Algeria, Lebanon, uh, uh, Libya, uh, uh, Israel, um, Egypt, but also Turkey. I mean, name them. It's all around the Mediterranean Sea and the Middle East. Sometimes they even go into the Gulf towards Dubai uh, or Kuwait. And this is a week long journey on a ship, which is rather heavy. And, uh, and it's very important that we as Greens make visible what is happening on the streets. There is like 80% of citizens which are opposed to live animal transports. And very often it helps to show what is actually going on in your own backyard, in your own region, in your own city or municipality. And for that, I want to show you a, a short video that we did this summer in Croatia, uh, namely Rasha, uh, where there's a small harbor which is basically dealing with two things. Wood, which would be an own uh, topic for an own parallel session, and live animal transports. Let's see the video of our last action there this summer. Please play the video. Wir sind hier im Süden von Istrien in der Gemeinde Rascha und wir sind hier, weil hier heute Nacht ein Schiff ankommt, das einige hundert, wenn nicht tausend Tiere laden wird. Und wir werden uns ansehen, wo die Transporte herkommen. Wir haben im Moment mehr als 30 Grad im Schatten. Hier auf dem Asphalt sieht man 45, 44, 45 Grad. Das heißt, in den LKWs wird es auch um die 40 Grad oder mehr haben. Und wir werden uns morgen ansehen, wie diese Tiere hier verladen werden, ob das alles noch im Rahmen des europäischen Rechts stattfindet oder schlicht und einfach illegal ist. Hier kommt jetzt das Schiff für den Tiertransport Uranus 2, ist bereits hier in der Bucht eingelaufen. Die werden am Hafen anlegen und heute Nacht oder morgen untertags die Tiere verladen. Wir werden uns das ansehen und weiter berichten. Wir sind um 5.30 Uhr aufgestanden und hierher gefahren nach Rascha, um uns anzusehen, ob die Tiere schon verladen worden sind in der Nacht, wo es kühl war. Dem ist nicht so. Die Rampe ist zwar montiert, die Arbeiter kamen in der Früh und mittlerweile stehen schon 10 LKWs in der prallen Sonne. Für heute sind mehr als 30 Grad angesagt. Das ist nicht nur unwürdig den Tieren gegenüber, sondern auch ungesetzlich. Es hat gut über 30 Grad. Es ist fast 2 Uhr mittags. Wir haben die Verladung von Schafen, von Kälbern und von wahrscheinlich männlichen Rindern beobachten können. Wir haben gesehen, wie sie die Zungen rollen. Das ist Hitzestress, das ist Wassermangel. Offensichtlich haben die Tiere kein Wasser bekommen. Wir haben gesehen, wie die Arbeiter sie aggressiv geschlagen haben, die Tiere übereinander gestiegen sind. So sollte man mit dir nicht umgehen. Wir beenden mal uns für heute unsere Mission und fahren wieder nach Hause. So there we work together with civil society and I mean, uh, I don't know, uh, it was in German, I'm sorry, with the English subtitles, 
but uh, you could clearly see how they use electroshockers. You could clearly see that uh, the trucks actually were waiting until midday in the bright sun, you know, with like more than 30 degrees outside. You've seen what we've measured on the road. Uh, it's really getting hot in there. So this is something where you can also ask your local veterinarian, how can that be? How can you allow that actually? Uh, and we've seen the ship getting loaded. And to tell you, these ship transports, they go for many days and sometimes many weeks with very high temperatures. It's very loud on the ships. There's uh, horrible hygiene standards and there's no controls. There's no vet on the ship. And sometimes there's like 20, 30,000 animals loaded on one single vessel. So there's no veterinarian there. There's always animals dying on the way because of the horrible circumstances. These animals are just thrown into the sea. And uh, actually, I mean, we see them from the unloadings that even many of the animals that survive are not fit to walk down from the ship anymore because they're so under heat stress, so uh, lacking water uh, and so under heat pressure also. And, uh, uh, and this is something where, where we clearly say this is so far from any EU regulation. This is so far from applying to the common EU rules that these kind of transports should just be stopped. And this is one of the main reasons also, you know, the, the problems internally uh, within, within the European Union, but also like all the export uh, um, stories is that we are, we are inquiring, we're having this inquiry committee in the European Parliament, where we're speaking to experts, to the commission, to veterinarians, but also to witnesses, to NGOs, uh, to police officers, to customs officers, uh, to really, make visible what is going on there and make it seen. And very often um, uh, already like filming it, making a post, uh, creating public attention for a problem is actually creating some improvements. Uh, a very concrete example, I've talked about calves earlier. Uh, I have actually put one of the veterinarians uh, in a station that loads calves in Austria. I've put him on trial because he was signing up papers of which he must have known that the data on the papers are not true. Uh, like the point of destination was not South Tyrol, but the point of destination was Spain. Uh, and since then, there was major improvements and I'm still very against transporting calves of this age. But as, again, there were massive improvements in this loading station. So they're taking care now that really every calf is fed before it goes on the truck. They have reduced the number of calves going on the truck. They have now to make a break in between and give the calves 24 hours of rest. So you can actually reach concrete improvements by pointing a spotlight on what is going on, on pointing a spotlight where you see animal suffering through creating public attention, maybe having some articles in the newspaper. That's how every one of us can help the animals in our surrounding beyond asking ourselves what we actually fuel with our very own money. And I know many young people draw the conclusion to go vegetarian, to go vegan, which is a good choice because that really, uh, uh, takes you out of that vicious circle of creating uh, um, animal suffering, but it's also a solution to buy solely organic or to actually approach your f next farmer uh, in your neighboring village and buy directly at the farmers or local slaughterhouses. If you want to eat meat, make sure that you're not fueling this kind of uh, cruel system uh, with your money. I think that's also something we can personally do and we can reach through spreading our message. So I will stop my intervention here to give us the maximum time for questions and other interventions. Uh, and I will uh, ask Theo to show me who wants to speak. Do we have questions already? I see there are questions. Um, Theo, will you allow someone to speak? then please do so. And, uh, if you want to ask a question, you need to raise your hand in, uh, in, the, in the menu on the left, and then I can uh, give you a broadcasting right so you can take the floor. There was someone before, but I think it was canceled. Um, so just raise your hand if you have a question.
Well, if there's no question now, then I would ask uh, Julia to, to elaborate a bit more on what your organization and your freelancers and your people are actually doing, or if you have concrete recommendations, maybe also beyond what I've mentioned already, as you're the professionals in that field, uh, what our people can actually do. You know, we have uh, members here from European Green Parties uh, from all over Europe, so it's far beyond the European Union. Uh, and uh, uh, is there some recommendations you can give to them how they can concretely uh, do action? Um, yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, well, first, what, what we are doing, while we, we are actually a small organization and we yeah, are dedicated to the protection of the animals during transport and well, we are doing investigations in all Europe, all across Europe. We are doing field investigations also outside Europe. On one hand, we are accompanying the transports from Europe to third countries. So, for example, we have been doing a lot on the transports to Turkey. We have been to Lebanon. We have been to different Middle East countries to, to see how the animals are treated there. And we think this is a very important field that we look also on, on the other end of the transport. I mean, of course, we have to improve the situation here in Europe and the best case is that we really prohibit the exports of live animals. As Thomas just pointed out, that transports are really cruel and what the animals have to undergo during these transports is not acceptable. And of course, you can imagine that the transports do not continue very well when the once the vessel, for example, arrives to Lebanon or to Turkey. Then they, first of all, the documents have to be done. The, all the customs checks have to be done. This means that the animals often remain on board the vessel for two, three, four days while the, the, all the paperwork is, is done. So. Often then the water, there's not sufficient water anymore, the food is already done, then um, of course nobody will clean the pans on the vessel and so on. And then the animals are not um, transferred, transferred to normal trucks, they're transferred on normal trucks, I mean what we understand as animal tr trucks, trucks designed for animal transport, no. It's often it's just construction vehicles, the ones that the other days, I don't know, yeah, transport any construction materials, what you can imagine. So their safety and their health is not, is endangered even more once they are transported further in these countries. And of course, often there's a lot of heat then and so on. So the, the, the the problem doesn't stop with the transport even sometimes yes it's true that the the holdings where they um, arrive there they might be okay but but what then was about the slaughter i mean we know that in many of these countries first of all there's no animal welfare legislation and then the slaughter methods yeah they are just yeah middle aged i mean as I said before, they would be considered criminal acts here in the EU. So, yeah, but what I actually wanted to say is that we also have to see, have a look at these countries and we have to see this, these countries take animal welfare seriously as well. We have to, in a way, export our, our standards to these countries to really make a change because if we will prohibit the export, which I'm absolutely in favor, but then they will buy the animals in South America. It will, they, the Middle East will always need those animals because they cannot breed them by themselves. So I think one thing is to really to try to go a step ahead and to, to see that we can in a way try to mainstream a bit more the animal welfare in, in those countries. 
And yes, well, Thomas, uh, yes, sorry, Thomas. Yes, uh, th thank you, Julia. Um, I see we, we have a question here uh, from Agne. Um, would you ask your question uh, now? Um, Theo will give you broadcasting rights. You want to ask a question um, by taking the floor? Then you um, you can just put on your 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 microphone and your camera if you want. Hello. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so thank you for the presentation and uh, i'm really uh, worried about all the animals on this planet <laughs> and uh, i would like just to ask because it's kind of you know it doesn't work in my opinion all the sanctions and regulations and it's just a game that we are playing and the time that we are wasting uh it gives maybe jobs for some people but uh, who cares when animals are suffering this way so much so what i think uh, the question is do you think it's possible to control it actually because i think uh, it's um, what we have to do is to reduce the demand of the meat because it's not good for the planet not good for the animals and not good for our own health too much of it so the prices has to be higher have to be higher and uh, all that European Union is doing for reducing it is not good. And then um, about the uh, clean meat and uh, meat from the lab, what do you think about it? Would it um, help to solve all these problems? Um, because I think it's very hard to control people with lower mentality because they don't care, they don't see animals and as some creatures that can scent just like us and can feel just like us. So, yeah, that's the question. If you understood, sorry for talking too much. <laughs> no problem. Uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, I will try to answer a first part um, on controls. Uh, well, I told you we're working on actually on uh, trying to enforce the uh, EU regulation from 2005 that is in place, knowing that this is not fit for purpose yet. We have to reduce transportation times massively. Uh, we have to put stricter regulations in place. And actually, through that inquiry committee, there's a, quite some pressure on the Commission to, to actually propose a new regulation and the enhanced uh, regulation. Still, this may not be all the way we have to go, but it's, it's a good next step. On controls, it makes a huge difference. Uh, you see different countries in the European Union taking it more serious, where they have more staff on it, they have more trained police officers on it. And I can give you an example of Austria, where not everything is perfect and not everything is fine yet, but the standards are comparably high. And like all the trucks, which are really, let's say, the truck drivers or the, the companies know already that they are not complying with the rules. They are not going through Austria anymore, but they actually surround Austria by a Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and then go south. So you see the pressure from controls is doing something, uh, uh, but it only works if really in the whole European Union, all the authorities take it serious, all the authorities know about the regulations, know how to enforce them, and also fine. And uh, also, Julia had it in her presentation, yeah, that we need a common regime of control, density, and fines. That would be very important. So we at least manage that these companies apply with the current rules, even though from the political side, we need to an, to an uh, increased and better version of the rules, uh, for sure. Um, on the question of demand, um, I, I, I hear what you say, and sure, there's a part of our population which does not care too much, but there's also a, part, a big part of population that cares in the moment they realize, that cares in the moment it gets visible for them. 
and sometimes uh, they are not looking themselves because they're not too keen to find out. But if they finally realize through news or through personal talks or through also uh, the work of the civil society, which is crucial in that battle. And I encourage you, if you want to do something for animal welfare, find the, the, the NGO working on animal welfare that is active in your region. My experience is that, that they're, they're happy uh, for contributions and they're happy for people that care and they're very cooperative also on that uh, on that issue. So um, on that side, I can just recommend uh, talk to them. Um, and to reduce the demand, yes, prices have to become higher. That has also links to the common agricultural policy, uh, which would be worth to talk about also in a parallel session once uh, about all the interlinkages. Uh, and on lab meat, uh, I'm a bit critical, you know, because uh, there's tofu, there's seitan, uh, there is, a, I mean, you can prepare food that it looks a bit like meat, that it even, the, the, the dishes taste nearly the same. I like to cook uh, very much uh, also with vegetarian and vegan options. And if you're a good cook, you can manage very well. So there's no need from my point of view to create some lab, whatever. Uh, uh, that's not really my style, but uh, it may have a market. But let's see what Julia says on, on your questions. Julia, do you want to answer as well? Yes, happy to do so. Well, I, I totally agree that the demand has to be reduced and also, I mean, especially during this year, we, we hear so often from the from scienti scientists that they say the number of farm animals in the world has to be reduced. I mean, we know that um, nearly all the pandemics were really had uh, came from, from, from animals, so um, yeah, I think we should start and rethink our relation to the animals and I think it would be a very, very important step to reduce the number of animals and then they could also be kept under better conditions if we would have less animals all across the world. Um, yeah, for the controls, to get this all this under control, the, the animal transports, I think the basis would be to really to reduce the transport time. If we shift all to regional, local production and transport, then it would, will be much easier to control. We will have a possibility to control the trucks, really, because now they go from one member state to the other, one, one region to the other, and already between the regions, sometimes the collaboration and cooperation and exchange of information is difficult. So you can imagine that it is even more difficult between member states or with EU and third countries. And so, in my opinion, this would be a first step to really shift to regional production and then, yeah, we have a better control. Um, what concerns lab meat, I, I think the same as, as Thomas, I don't see the need for it. Um, I, I, really, I, I, I think we have, <laughs> we have enough food um, from, from other sources and I cannot really imagine that that is, there's a real need for that. Thanks. There is one added question for you, Julia. Uh, um, I was, I, I don't know, the person didn't raise their hand, but they just put it into the chat, so I will pick it up here. Uh, and the question is to you, Julia, uh, what experience do you have with police checks on animal transport? Very interesting. Yes, it's indeed a very interesting question and I think you mentioned it before already. It, it depends very much on the, on the member country and also, of course, on the police officer you, or you meet during the check. So what we usually do when we see a problem, um, yeah, we call police and sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. And then what happens? Um, we meet police officers that just don't know what to do. So they are in front of the truck and they have no idea. So, I mean, recently we had a case, a transport of lambs 
and well, the police officers were convinced that the animals were goats. So just to start with. Um, so sometimes it's, it's really difficult because they are not sufficiently trained. What they do then is to call the official veterinarian that is responsible for that region. But what happens? In case it's after four o'clock in the afternoon and mainly the things happen during night in the evening or in the early morning hours, then the vet is not reachable. So then either they well, they stop the truck, but is not allowed according to the regulation <laughs> because it cannot be detained for longer than, than two hours. Or they just let it go because they, they don't know what to do. Yeah, but we have also in some countries, of course, we have, we have police that it better, it is better trained, as for example in Italy. Um, in general, they are really well trained. I must say also by, by Animals Angels and um, Italian NGO. And also the, uh, the sanctions in Italy are quite high and they can issue the sanctions on the spot. This is really something that helps, helps a lot. But another problem that I also mentioned before is, for example, we check a truck in Liguria, which is in the north of, of Italy just near the border with France and well the police and the vet decide oh yes we have to unload the animals and then the closest place to unload them is like three hours away and of course this place only has limited space to accommodate animals and if it's already full booked by other trucks that have planned their, their breaks there then it has to go to the next available stable, which then means another journey of six hours under conditions, yeah, which are already difficult for the animals. So yeah, it's 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 a problem. Police controls also are not possible when it's hot. So in summer, usually we don't call police. We only call police in the night because. A police control is normally always two hour minimum because they have to check the, all the documents and to call the official vet and so on. So we cannot risk that the animals are detained during high temperatures. So we, we only do that in the night. Um, yes, in general, I would say police is collaborative. They try to help, but often, yeah, they have their own limitations due to lack of training because vets are not reachable, because they have no place where to put, to put the animals when they have to detain the trucks. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I have seen, meanwhile, Wanda raising her hand, lowering her hand, raising it again and lowering it again. Wanda, do you still want to take the floor? Yes, go ahead. Can we try to get Wanda on the screen? Okay, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, maybe we try later. Maybe you can raise your hand again if your question is still valid. Uh, I saw uh, Joanna. Uh, oh yeah, Wanda has permission, but not using it. Okay. Uh, then I've seen uh, a chat note from Joanna. Maybe you want to take the floor and tell all of us what you've written in the chat. Joanna? From Portugal, Os Verdes. Let's see. I hear something's happening. Okay, I hope this is not due to technical problems here. It looks a bit like. Okay, Ioana is not using uh, the, the broadcasting rights. So I hand over to Fernando. Fernando, you also raised your hand uh, with the question. The floor is yours.
Do we have a technical problem, Theo? I think so. It seems like everything is working. Fernando, can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I hear it. Oh, so, okay. So, I'll, again, thank you very much for for, for the speech. Uh, indeed, I think the situation of animals, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky uh, all over Europe. So my question to you would be that, I mean, considering the current situation uh, where we are now, what actually the EU can do in order to force, uh, to force the, let's say, member states to, uh, to, imply, to apply to the current rules? Because I think one of the problems is that, yes, we do need to revise the rules that we, are, we have now, uh, to improve them, but so far still, this the, the rules that they are, are in place are not are not uh, let's say somehow followed. But some mem some member member states. So what can actually Europe do on that sense? I think this question maybe probably Thomas would be the right person to to answer to that. Would would the infringement procedure, for for instance, be some a, some uh, somehow a tool to force them to do something about about animal transport? Thank you, Fernando, for that question. Uh, and uh, indeed, I mean, well, infringement procedure, I would say, is the last step the Commission should take. First of all, what we've seen in the inquiry committee already, that the Commission itself lacks data. They don't really know how many controls are happening in, across Europe. They don't really know how many fines are giving, given. They don't know how many animals were stopped to be unloaded. They have no idea. We had the court of auditors and I asked for the data and they were like, mm, well, we only have what the member states report to us. We have no own data. Uh, so, uh, I mean, to really research what is going on on the field would be the first and very important step for the commission to take. And then, sure, in the next step, uh, pressure the, the member states uh, through recommendations first, through reports pressure them to do controls, to deliver also uh, the data every year to the Commission, uh, proving that they do the controls and that they have fines uh, given and that they are, that they are um, uh, applying the EU regulation. And, I mean, the Commission should take the court ruling of the Court of Justice of 2018 serious. And that says clearly, European animal welfare legislation on transport applies until the point of destination. So that means minimum to the harbor of Beirut or maybe Alexandria. So at least at, uh, to, up to the point when animals are unloaded. And that is clearly not happening. What happened in Germany is that many lenders, due to uh, a lot of public attention created very much by civil society, but also by, by some politicians helping out there, but by creating this, this public attention, um, actually many German states stopped exports, truck exports uh, to Russia. That just, what that, but, but what that uh, caused is that now many of these cows or, or yeah, male cow, uh, female cows uh, are now not exported directly from Germany, but they're for, first brought to Hungary, uh, where the journey even takes longer. And then in Hungary, they don't take it so serious. And they're just allowing the transports to Russia. So they're just uh, circumventing uh, actually the, the bans of, of the German authorities. So we need also a Europe-wide coherent approach uh, to that question. Uh, do you want to add something, Julia? Yes, I would like to add just one example to, on what you, you said about the, the reports of the member states that are, is, are given to the, the EU Commission. The EU Commission, uh, the, the member states every year have to report about their infringements and their tax and so on to the, to the EU Commission. And if, yeah, we have been going through these reports very much in detail and it's quite clear that that these data are not reliable and it's also clear that the Commission knows about that but they're just accepting them without following up, without doubt, without any doubts and for example um, the data from, from Bulgaria, they for years and years there have been many many NGOs and investigations checking trucks on the Bulgarian-Turkish border and 
it was clear that a lot was going wrong there, that the vets at the border exit, border exit control from Bulgaria to Turkey, they often closed their eyes and, and just did the trucks go and say, stating that there were no, everything was okay and there were no infringements. And the NGOs at the same time, in every single transport, saw and detected infringements. So having less data and less access to the, to the tracks, we as NGOs, we saw more infringements than the vets. This is not possible. And then during uh, one of the platform meetings of the EU Commission, the Animal Welfare Platform, the um, well, the, the Bulgarian representative said that yes, there are 100, nearly 100 percent of the trucks passing that border are, are okay. There are no infringements, and this is just a lie. I mean, and we know that the Commission is aware about this, but it's just not taken into account. This is a big problem, I think. Yes, I hope we are changing something there. Uh, and uh, we've seen some more attention by the Commission already, by the new Commission. Uh, uh, but yeah, let's see what we reach. Um, so if I, I don't see a very urgent question in the moment, um, do I see a raised hand? Let me check. Okay, not in the moment. That, okay, let's use the opportunity to actually see uh, an added uh, possibility of what you can actually do to raise public attention. And uh, many of you may know our Tilt Network, our campaign network, uh, where we also run campaigns on animal welfare, uh, different topics, different cases. Uh, and not only that, that we we from like center centralized Brussels uh, are running some of the um, campaigns, but there are also other options for you to use that platform. And at that point, I would hand over to Fernando to show what uh, options you have and what is done here. Fernando, floor is yours. Well, thank you once again, uh, Thomas, uh, for the floor. Uh, so my name is Fernando Shironda, and I'm one of the Tilt campaigners. Uh, well, today I'm just going to briefly introduce to you what it tilt is uh, for those who doesn't uh, know yet and uh, also some part of the work that we've been doing on animal welfare. So, well, tilt is a, is a citizen movement fighting for change, basically. So as we know, uh, fighting for fair and greener and social Europe has never been more important and urgent. Uh, as we also know that also there are millions of people uh, outside there across Europe who want that change. So through TILT, we bring people from all over to, uh, Europe together to, to make that change real. And uh, we do it through petitions, mobilizations and uh, different other type of, of actions. So for example, uh, last year, as Thomas was saying, we, we, we launched this animal transport campaign because we, uh, we, we 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 know that the situation on uh, on uh, animal transport, of course, as we heard uh, today, is not uh, let's say it's horrific in the Aurora River, uh, all over Europe and behind. So what we want with this campaign is basically that the EU set a maximum journal time and distance to slaughters and uh, to revise the regulation one uh, para 2005, uh, as we 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 heard also in this uh, conversation today to harmonize this with uh, standards on animal welfare. Uh, so far, the campaign has uh, reached uh, almost 30,000 uh, 30, um, signatures. And um, the, the, these signatures, the idea is that we deliver those to the new uh, inquiry committee on animal transport, the EU inquiry committee, I mean. So uh, I would just take this opportunity to kind of ask you for your help as well to sign the petition to make sure that we reach this number we are very much close to that so if you each of us can just uh, sign uh, if you didn't do it yet and also share it that will be super amazing and we can finally hang over the signatures and then ask for more concrete actions through uh, the inquiry committee um but uh 
I also want to take this opportunity, if you allow me, uh, since we believe, we strongly believe that the future is ours as a citizen and we need to come together and act. So now I will try to briefly also introduce to you a new tool that we are also uh, putting in place to allow members, to, uh, member parties, uh, our green MEPs to campaign and to push for campaigns. And this tool is called Tilt by You petition. So Tilt by You is going to be, as I said, uh, uh, let's say um, uh, an opportunity for AGP member parties and, uh, and, and the, the, the Greens and the, uh, the in the parliament to uh, create their own petitions on the topics that they do care about on our platform. So what do you need to do uh, in order to be able to do that? It's basically just to um, follow some of the uh, steps that are also in the slides that you can see. So basically the content of the campaigns that uh, uh, you guys could or want to propose to us should have let's say, a more green agenda, a broader green agenda. It also has a, an European or transnational kind of frame or angle. So that's not something that's super kind of related to a specific national level, but something that can happen at the national level, but can have also a resonance at the, at the, at the European dimension. Uh, how does it work? So it's easy. Uh, basically, you just need to submit to us your proposal, your idea, just by writing uh, uh, to us through the, the the website that you can or you will find out in our in our in our in our page at some point. We are still on the process of putting together all this, and then we will get back to you within uh, two days, saying more or less how can we proceed with the topic and and uh, and uh, try to figure out if there are some some other issues that we can help with. Uh, with, uh, and then give some, let's say, feedback on that. Uh, and basically, you are also the primary responsible to promote the campaign because then when you launch the campaign, is of course, it's that because you need people to get engaged and then be more participant, uh, participative on that. So it's also kind of, yeah, uh, we also invite uh, those who are going to propose the campaign to kind of push for it so in order to, to be able to make sure that the campaign runs. Um, and then, of course, there is a, a, an issue about, I mean, issue. There is also a point that people, of course, are signing. And then they, when they sign, they also give, uh, let's say, uh, an opt-in to, to, our, to, our, to receive feedback about or, the, or updates about the campaign you have launched. So there is also, you're going to find some kind of guidelines on the, on the, on the Tilt platform, on the Tilt by You platform that guides you more or less on how to build the entire thing that you you need to know in order to make sure that uh, your campaign is up. Just to just to give you an example, and then I'm gonna give the floor to the to the speakers. I'm gonna share with you here if the tech issue allows me to do it. I'm not sure how to do it there, uh, but I, I'm gonna try to share with you mm -hmm. one of the petition that we have already online, uh, where one of the um, MEPs, uh, the Parliament. Uh, shared with us the idea and then we uh, welcomed the idea and then this is the first kind of petition that we we are promoting through via this uh, Tilted by You petition platform. So I just need to figure out what I should do to share my screen. If uh, Theo can help me to figure it out, that would be amazing. So you should have a screen sharing button somewhere uh, in your in the left-hand column. Hello, camera on. Leave this one. Oh, maybe here. Wait. Hello. Workspace. No, nope, I cannot see it. Okay, anyways. Uh, I don't want to. There are three dots on the side. And if you go on the three dots, there's a menu opening and one okay, screen where you can share. Yes, yes. So um, I'm going to share my screen and that will be hello i just need to go to the right screen voila and then get it from there here we go it should be so this is the page where you can put the campaign so you have as you can see 
this is the the page that is we are going to uh, basically promote the, your campaigns and there are some terms and, and conditions where you can see actually what you should follow uh, what you should do in order to have your 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 content in in there but uh, um, also you um, you would have for example uh, um, this if I'm not sure if you can still see my screen but if you not please just let me know so that I can change this so for example now this is the petition can you see the petition hello yes can you still see the petition that I'm sharing yes, yes. so this for example is one of the examples of uh, one uh, the, let's say campaign on uh, on uh, Turkish uh, that we are we are running, and this was a campaign that was proposed by one MPP in the parliament, and we basically um, well, we just we are running it, and it has uh, four hundred supporters, more than four hundred supporters now. So, but that's to give you an example of what actually this means in a, in a, in a real life. So that means that you can have a campaign in our tilt platform. Because that's what exactly we want. We want to support member parties in their works, but also on the top and on topic wise, and then use Tilt as a channel to kind of you know, uh, yeah, mobilize people somehow. So that's it for me. And uh, again, I invite you to uh, go to our Tilt Power website, sign the petition on animal transport, help us reach the thirty thousand signatures, and then also to start sharing your campaigns on your ideas uh, to run. Uh, tilt by you because we really need you to support us on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fer Fernando, of giving us this insight. Uh, uh, so, so there's also uh, there's the opportunity for you to use that tool also to point a lot of public attention uh, to the topics of animal welfare uh, around you. Uh, so now I will have a look whether there are some more added questions. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see actual questions, so maybe I will raise a question also towards animals angels and uh, and this is uh, to be to be concrete. I mean, you said uh, you're working also on the shipping transports and uh, can you maybe tell us a bit more of what you have witnessed, uh, what happens uh, during the shipping transports? Uh, because I think this is one of the chapters which is most dark of of, of all, uh, let's say, uh, of all the uh, yeah of, of of all the parts of this kind of cruel uh, animal breeding and production. Because yeah, sure, the stables are not transparent, but then when the animals go from the stables on the truck to the slaughterhouses, at least there citizens can have a look at authorities can have a look and veterinarians can have a look and there can be checks uh, if uh, authorities take it serious. But how is it on ships, Julia? Uh, what, what are your experience as animals, uh, animals angels uh, when it comes to transport of mass animals on ships? Would you share that with us, please? Um, yes, sure. Um, I think it's all a chain of, of problems. Uh, um, this starts that often already the have presentation on in your video before. Um, then often they have to wait long times on both the trucks inside the harbors until the loading finally starts. This is the first part of the problem. And then the vessels, um, if you, you can check the vessels, uh, for example, in, in web pages like, um, I don't know the names, no, but there are public web pages where you can check all the vessels, vessel finder and, and so on. And you see that they are often more than 40 years old and they're not properly inspected. And you can imagine that a vessel with 40 or even elder is has not the most modern standards so very often they are yeah it's just too narrow the um, the ways the animals have to take inside the vessels are really very narrow they are very steep they are dangerous they are slippery then 
about the stuff we have on the vessels is not properly trained. So the, the first problem when entering the vessel is that the animals fall, the animals slip, the animals are afraid, the animals have to, to go from, from a um, lightened space from outside to a dark inside, which makes them hesitate, which makes them afraid. Then they are pushed by electric products or whatever to enter the, the vessel. Then they find themselves in narrow, um, dark, slippery pathways. So, and once they are on board the vessels, um, yeah, the air condition often is, is very poor. And of course, when they're, as long as the animals are on board the vessel, the worse the, the air gets inside because often the animals are kept under deck, whereas there is just forced air condition and there is no natural air exchange. Often the, um, the decks are, are not very high. So the air inside is, is just not, yeah, it's just horrible. Often there are no or not sufficient vets on board the trucks. So we have only untrained staff to look after the animals that don't detect any problems. Often there's just no space to control, to check every single animal. And we have not enough staff to check on every single animal. Then of course, there's no journey time limit. It can, yeah, these transports can endure can long times, days and even weeks. Then as I mentioned before, often they have to, to wait on board the truck before, uh, on board the vessel before the journey actually starts. They have to wait again on, the, on board the vessel once they arrive to the harbor of destination because all the documents have to be done, the paperwork, the customs checks and so on. Um, yeah, I think to summarize, the major problems are that injured animals are not detected, they're not, not, just not seen, they don't receive any any treatment any emergency aid any uh, there is no possibility to to help them in when they have problems um the air condition inside is just horrible really i've been once for example on on a ship that came from argentina and with horses from italy and i think the journey took three weeks or something like that we we went on board the vessel when it arrived to Italy and just the smell of ammonia was, was so biting that just to give you an example, I put my, the clothes that I had on twice in the washing machine and the ammonia smell didn't, didn't get out of it. So I had just to throw them away just to show you how, how, how really bad it is. And and yes, of course, then also the, the pens where the animals are accommodated, they cannot be cleaned properly or they are not cleaned. You know, I think from, from many media reports that sick or dead animals are just thrown overboard. And yeah, there's a number of problems. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Thanks. Um, maybe, I mean, uh, if you still want to ask a question, I would say um, indicate that to us. Um, I just want to touch upon uh, three points which we have not touched upon yet. And this is, first of all, the farmers. Uh, not all the animals that go on animal transports or even in ex towards the export are from big breeders. Many of them also come from small and medium sized farms. and. Uh, uh, you will see the next uh, video that comes out from my side. I'm following Austrian calves uh, on their track towards Spain and then on their track on the ship uh, and then uh, towards Lebanon. And uh, we actually uh, had also from a cooperation with civil society um, 
with Animos Internationals in that case, and Manfred Karemann from German ZDF, uh, who does a lot of films about that topic. Uh, we had some footage about a slaughtering in Lebanon and the slaughtered animal there with an Austrian earmark. And you know, these earmarks, yeah, the, the small animals get them and they stay until they are slaughtered. So even if they are fattened somewhere else, always their earmarks stay. So we saw that this is an Austrian earmark and we, we, we tracked it back. You can actually track it back and we tracked it back to a very small mountain farmer in Tyrol, which is in the high mountain area. And really he was a farmer in the land, landscape like this, very steep uh, with about 20, 25 cows. So not a big uh, producer. And we were confronting him um, with the pictures of where his animal actually ended that he has originally sold. And he was super unhappy with seeing that footage. And he was making us believe, and I believe him absolutely, that first of all, he didn't know that his animal will go uh, down that road. And he didn't know that his animal will end up that way somewhere uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and, uh, and he regretted that he ever sold that animal. And actually, one thing I want to I wanna pass on to you, if you have farmers in your neighborhood, if you know farmers that are selling cows or, or other animals, they can actually restrict on their sales papers, on their contracts, they can restrict the animals to stay within the European Union. They can actually ban exportation of their very animal they are selling in that moment. That's an important information because many farmers, if they would know, they would do that uh, uh, if they sell their animals. The second thing is, you, you may see horrible pictures of slaughter uh, in the Middle East. And uh, we hear it a lot from the far right also that are attacking these kind of slaughters with a, let's say, religious sentiment. But to make one thing clear, we had this film footage from a very cruel slaughter uh, in, in Lebanon, and we showed it to Muslim leaders, to religious leaders, and their unanimous feedback was, this is not halal, this is haram, this is how you should not treat an animal. Because if you look closely, halal is actually an old and not fit for 21st century, but still it's an, an animal protection scheme. It says things like, no animal should see its brother or sister be dying in front of his eyes or her eyes. And that's not something that is applied uh, uh, our days. So it's clearly not a religious story that animals shall or have to be slaughtered in that cruel way. And why are these countries buying them alive? Because there's a lack of cooling chain. So this is also something where the union can invest. So we can actually, if we need to export animals, please slaughter them in Europe and then export the meat. And there is ways to slaughter also with reversible stunning uh, um, animals after, uh, let's say, a ruling that is fit to meet also the religious conditions of the Muslim community. So don't go into that trap of, let's say, uh, fueling sentiments against religious community. It has nothing to do with religion. Yes, it has something to do that these societies are not really developed on animal welfare standards anyhow. And that's something what we can, can contribute. And also on the exports, uh, an animal, let's say a sheep, uh, Romania exports a lot of sheep uh, also towards Kuwait or towards uh, Dubai. And let the, the farmers there, they get 25 euros per sheep, grown up sheep, which is not a lot. And then in Kuwait or uh, in Dubai, the sheep are sold for 250 euros per sheep. So it's 10 times the money. That means the transportation, if on the transportation, even half of the animals die, there's still profit. And we have to look at that. Who is actually making profit on that cruel business and also shame and blame these companies and persons. This was the added impact, input I wanted to give. And now I have a look and I see there's, oh, there's a late question um, from Nicholas. Okay, I think we have a few minutes more left. Nicholas, please take the floor and ask your question so we can all hear it. Is that okay for you? Go ahead.
You want to take the floor, Nicolas? Are you still with us? Everything is a bit slower. Thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, I was a bit late. I hope this wasn't discussed further, uh, but I will keep myself short. Um, I, I wrote my master thesis about the uh, the meat lobby and how how it is all concentrated. And there's a lot of concentration in especially Western Europe, Northwest, and um, especially now with COVID at the moment, there like the for example the Bavarian region tries to decentralize the whole business. And I wonder is that actually feasible on the European scale? Um, is there more of it happening? And is it up to the is it fundable on the EU to, for example, to support mobile slaughterhouses, or is it, in the end of the day, really in the national or local hands? Um, that's my question. Thank you. Very concrete question, and, and thank you for that. Uh, we just had the Agri Commission of Wojciechowski uh, in our inquiry committee this week, actually, where we were exactly raising these kind of questions. And in fact, under the second pillar uh, uh, cap, so, so common agricultural policy, which is called the Ru rural development pillar, there are fundings which can be used for regionalization. And the commission also clearly stated that in the farm to fork strategy, which is not only talking about reduction of pesticides and fertilizers, but also of local value chains and relocalization of food production, he actually clearly said, this is our intention and this is what we want member states to do, but we need to hope that in their strategic plans, they are delivering on that. And uh, that didn't go far enough for us because the commission would have the possibility to ring fence parts of that money, to actually say, well, 5% of all rural development funds have to go into regionalization. And if you're not putting it into regionalization, you can't use that money. Yeah? Uh, so there would have been ways to, to actually put more pressure on the member states. But at least uh, the commission has realized that this is an issue and they have realized and also in their communication, they're encouraging the member states. But it's going to be important that we also as, as Greens in the member states have an eye on what our governments do. And on the strategic plans they're actually proposing to the union on the cap, how they intend to use the cap money, uh, that would be very important. And also uh, on on, uh, lo on, on uh, local slaughtering, um, yes, it's part of uh, what is eligible uh, for EU money. But again, it depends very much on the member states. And it was also very good to hear that the commissioner said, yes, we also have to rethink some hygienic standards for small producers. Uh, because you can't apply the very same standards than for the big slaughtering industry. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're, you, you would actually uh, decrease the chances to have local, uh, local slaughtering uh, if, you, if you apply the very same rules than for the industry, for the big industry. Uh, but, you know, uh, this is what they're saying. On the other hand, a regulation for exceptions, an exception uh, to the rules uh, for small slaughtering uh, of chickens, as an example, for small producers, for direct market marketing uh, is ending at the end of this year and the commission didn't do anything to replace it. Maybe they do now because we drove a lot of public attention on that because they can't say A one day and do B on the other day. And I tell you, the meat lobby is really big. And that's very much not anymore about farmers, but more and more about companies like Smithfield, but also very much linked to the agrochemistry sector. They're trying to take over the production on a large scale. And this is something we have to counter urgently uh, uh, there. If you're interested, look at the capping debate. The parliament says a maximum of 100,000 euros of subsidies, no more. Well, member states like Czech Republic, Hungary and so on, where the prime minister's sons or themselves profit personally from millions of cap subsidies are actually harming that approach. So have a look what your what your what your own governments do because that's where a lot is decided at the end of the day. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. I thank think you the time much. is running out. Is there still yes. some time for another small question? Okay, quick. Go quick. Okay. okay. Um, do you think it's feasible to do a specific competition law for the meat sector or the animal transport sector, like competition law, like in other energy sectors, for example, or telecommunication? Because the, I think there's a clear competition problem in, with the size. Yes, there is a competition problem with the size. 
uh, you're right, uh, and uh, we shall look closer into that. Uh, thank you for that recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Tackle it from that side. Uh, but there's also a competition problem with transporters. You know, with transporters that apply EU regulations and that try to at least meet the regulations that are in place now. And that is costly. It costs more money. And they have a competition problem with companies that don't care. Yeah? And so also there we have to make sure that really every member state and every company uh, is checked and controlled that they at least apply to these minimum standards that we have. Otherwise, we make it difficult for the, for the companies. And there are some that really try to apply at least the current uh, animal welfare standards. So that's also an imp important and, and dif a difficulty in terms of competition. So thank, thank you, you so much for your questions. And I will hand over to Julia for some last words uh, to finalize our session. Julia, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Thomas. Yes, just summarizing, I think we have a lot of work ahead still. And I'm very happy about the initiative of, of ANIT and also of the Commission, and I hope that all together, um, yeah, we can achieve a change for the animals on the transports. And yeah, count on us, count on the NGOs for whatever you need, for whatever, whatever support you need. Um, we are here and we are happy to help and also to support your work. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, and also thanks for the very good cooperation I, I have uh, uh, been allowed to witness. Uh, thanks, very, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you that were interested in this session. I hope we were able to deliver some uh, not only horrible messages on what is going on, but also to encourage you uh, to pick the topic up and uh, to do action wherever you can, wherever you see. Uh, you can have an impact. We can all have an impact. Thank you very much for joining this session, and I hope to see you later in one of our parallel sessions or somewhere else uh, in this, unfortunately, again, online conference, online council. Hope to see you in person in spring. I hope to see you very much soon. So bye from my point here. See you later. <laughs>